Hello again, everybody. This is episode two of Loose Lips. Uh, I'm going to be speaking with Paddy, aka P, owner of Golden Team Gym, Thai and Boxing Gym. Going to be getting uh, into his life and uh, his successes. So he's just joined now. Shout out, Army Nick. Yes, Nick, I see you. Respect to everybody coming through. I see you, Paddy. If you want to add me the request, then let's roll, my brother. Shout out Nathan for uh, putting ours up live as well. Yes, mate. Most wanted coming through. Yes, mate. Sitters under the brand name. Cheeky. Like it. <laughs> yeah, man. Respect for everyone coming through. I'm just waiting for Paddy to... Leeds, Leeds. <laughs> I'm waiting for Paddy to uh, send me the request. And then we're good to go. Hello, B... Also, if anyone is we're uh, nattering through, if anyone wants to ask, uh, feel free. And as the questions come through, I'll put them to the man who's about to join me now. I get a big smile because technology has linked us. I see him. How are you doing, brother? You good? How are you? You all right, mate? I'm blessed, mate. I'm very blessed, brother. Yeah, how are you? Very good. Yeah, good. Good. Very good. Re respect for uh, doing this, mate. No problem, mate. No problem. Not much else to what, do, is there? So we might as well have a chat, eh? Yeah, yeah, we've got no else to do, you know what I mean? <laughs> how have you been finding that? Like, obviously, someone who's very uh, physically active, and how, how have you found the sort of change? Uh, well, it's obviously been a bit of a shock to me, really. Obviously, being around a lot of people, you know, I can have like 300 people come through my gym a week, uh, you know, seeing all my fighters and people that I work with and stuff like that. So, at first, it was a little bit of a shock, but. Um, just try to be positive, really. I've been doing a little bit of training at home and, uh, you know, going for a run and ch ch chilling out with my family, watching some boxing documentaries and just being positive, like you say. If, if you're negative about it, you know, p people find a problem with a solution. But if you're positive, you'll find a solution to the problem. So we've just got to, we've got to it, crack brother. on and deal with it, haven't we? Preach it, brother. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a believer of that as well. Uh, John Lennon said, the answer's in the solution, not the problem. And I'm, That's I'm the a one. believer of that. That's the one, mate. Positivity so, is the key. It is the key. And gratitude as well, man. And gratitude, yeah, man. I find. Um, I want to ask then, did you have any fighters or any, any of your like, sort of people in camp? Were there anybody that yeah. were... Has it disrupted anything like that? Yeah, it's disrupted everything, really, because obviously the British Boxing Board of Control have cancelled the boxing season, so I had... Um, sorry, I had to that you. When you, sorry to cut you, when you say season, yeah, like football season, it's sort of calendarised, but boxing seems quite like 24-7-365, so is there actual season? Yeah, an amateur boxing, there's a season that runs from September through to about July or something like that. Then they have a rest over the summer. And I've been putting a lot of shows on myself. I mean, we've got a lot of young amateur fighters coming through and I want to keep them active. You know, not not really waiting for fights and being able to fight on their own shows. But, you know, I had a, I had a guy that I worked with, Mark Day Casey. He was fighting in London in the UFC. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, going a lot. Yeah, yeah, he was fighting in London in the UFC. Um, so we're just sort of finishing off, sharpening him up really, and he was looking really good. It were a, it were a major fight for him. Um, you know, Mick Leamont was going to be fighting again. It was an undefeated cruiserweight. It was ten and zero. Uh, he was going to be fighting in July, June or July, something like that. And then I had another girl, Nicola Bark, who was actually going to be fighting for a world title in August. So everything's been ruined really. But like I say, we've just got to crack on. I'm sure the time will come. Yeah, exactly. I think the, the the opportunities that they've got there are incredible, and I think obviously you'd like to Hi, well, Laura. You'd, you'd like to think that um, the situations will still present themselves afterwards because that's what was set on the card. Yeah, well, hopefully everything will just get postponed and all the same fights will happen. Now, the the biggest fight really was um, I don't know if you've heard of Dean Smith, Smudger the calling. Um, he's a bare knuckle fighter, so he's a bare knuckle boxer, and it's getting really popular. And um, since I've took Smudge on, he's had a knockout win and a career best performance. And he's he was in the final, and it's ten thousand pounds for the winner. Um, so I think that I think that was going to be the end of May, and we were just going to put Smudge in camp for that. And that's been knocked back as well. Um, so 
you know, like I say, all all the lads are missing the gym. I'm getting loads of texts and messages and stuff like that. I can't wait to get back training because we've got a good family orientated I'm, gym. And like you know, family. yeah, I've got a lot of good people, and you know, they're not just my fighters; they're my friends, and and you get close to them. And you, when when you are a fighter and stuff like that, and you, you you've trained, you've ate right, you've ran, and you you know, you've took so much out of your body to get your fight stops like that you know it's a, it, it's major really because it's the career it's the lives it's it's how to put the food on the table get punched in the face for a living <laughs> just, can just i just say as well josh milson there he says that my hair looks like a crow's nest <laughs> <laughs> the band is speaking fast coming through me yeah. everyone's like shelling it out man yeah um, i'll get some stick on here just to just to touch on that then because that's a really interesting side that um a lot of fans might not see is when people are cutting weight or the actual, you yeah. know, the training and build up to it, right? The the sacrifice that is going into it. Can you can you can you touch on that a bit more? Like, what is what is the switching focus like at that in, point? In in the when, that's, when pretty, the that's pretty like the most critical bit, really. Yeah, are you pretty, talking about pretty, when the cut when they're cutting weight and they're trying to weight weight and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the uh, that's the hardest thing for a fighter, believe it or not. First of all, you've got to get your fighter. If he hasn't been in the gym and, you know, been living the life, you've got to take the weight out of your fighter first, bring him down slowly, and then you've got to study their opponent. And together as a team, you can build, build a plan, uh, you know, obviously against whoever they're fighting. But cutting weight is horrible and they become horrible as well. I can see when they're coming to the gym, the heads are down. It's the hardest part for them. You know, it is, it is, it's the hardest part of being a fighter. He's cutting, he's cutting massive amounts of weight. But in saying that, if you are fighting at a top level, you know, you should be living the life of a fighter and, um, yeah. you know, staying in the gym all the time and cutting, you know, you know, just being, being focused on your sport. That's why I'm just thinking I'm Agnes now because I'm a trainer. <laughs> <laughs> do you find that's mad though because it sounds like you know as much as it's like the physical training there's a lot of psychological sort of uplifting there's a lot of morale boosting there's a, you know you're almost like a, a therapist in a way if the reds are yeah to oh, you, you become everything you, you become a when you're training fighters you become a counselor you become the bird you become like the you know like a, a psychiatrist that you know it, you, it's it's not just executing a game plan and you know telling them to do this and do that and get fit and go for a run. You you are actually being sort of a dad to them, really. You know you try to look after their best their best interest because when you have got a fighter going into a boxing ring or a cage and they're they're about to get punched or kicked or need or elbowed, it's you that is in charge of the instructions and you know what goes on, but. In saying that, if you have fighters, you, there's a saying you can take an horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So once they get through the ropes, it's down to them, really. And nine times out of ten, if you listen to your trainer, you know, if you've got a decent trainer, everything will go to plan. It's when you stop listening to your trainer and, you know, you, you think you're the finished article and, and you think you're better than everyone else. And I've had that before because you, you, nobody's the finished article. I've been doing this sport 18 years and I'm still learning, do you know what I mean? So it's it's it's... It's always learning. It, that must be, you know, from your point of view, one of the most difficult juggling acts is the uh, varying personalities. Yeah. Of everybody that comes through the door. You, you, so you, how, 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 I mean, I'm, you, you're very grounded, you know, when we've met, when we chat, I always speak you up, mate, because you are, you, you speak from the heart and it's always a genuine, like, oh, it's, nice, it's always you. just a genuine, like, encounter, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, do you have to mould how you are around certain people or do they know how you are and they have to, like, rise to what you want? Um, do you know what? I, I sort of, like, you, there's diff, all sorts of different people. There's there's certain fighters where I I know how to be with them in the changing room. You know, for example, Mikkel's just joined here. He's very relaxed. You know, he don't, he, don't, he don't get overly nervous or out like that. He knows there's a job in hand and I know that. Just let him listen to his music, let him relax. You know, I'll ask him how he's feeling, making sure he's still having his water and everything's on track. And then, you know, once we start warming up and get the gloves on, it's time to go to work, you know, and that, I'm, the, I'm the boss, you know, but we're still friends. We're friends. You, you can be friends with your fighters, you know, ring my fighters up, see how they are, you know, and, 
and stuff like that. But when they come into the gym, I'm the gaffer, I'm the boss, and that and that's that's how it's got to be. Otherwise, you don't get the respect you you, you need from a fighter. And if they don't respect you, there's no point being a team. And in saying that, there's there's fighters that are that are, are super nervous and you know, oh I'm, I'm nervous and panicking and stuff like that. And you've got to psych them up. You've got to. Maybe I don't know. You, you know, there's there's certain fighters in the past where I've had to say, to them, "Come on, you got to do it. You got to do it for your mum or your family." And you come on, your family are out there. You've trained for this. And there might be fighters who there's fighters that said to me in the changing room, "I'm going to smash him. He's getting smashed." I said, "Well, you got to chill out a little bit. Do you know what I mean? We've got to feel him out and see what's happening." So every every fighter is different. Every personality is different. And when you generate a bond with the fighter then you, uh, you know how to deal with them and that's just all in experience and, and stuff like that. Well, Simo's just asked a question and I was going to sort of lean a little oh, he's got a bit, he's got a bit more brutal with it. Boss at My all. question and then leaning into his then is, you'd like, you know, from the outset, you've got an opening and close of a gym. You know, start, open doors. But you've just said there, yeah. you're ringing them all the time. So... How does that lean into your personal sort of time that you have? Or do you get to put a time away where it is just family time and then, you know, is it a window? And then also, leaning on with what Simon said, who's the boss at home? Well, it's funny you ask that because when you're a trainer, you know, you, you, your life it revolves around the gym. So our last is to me, if I put a pair of boxing gloves on, do you think you'll take more notice of me? So I says, <laughs> I wonder what weight I can get you down to. <laughs> <laughs> So that's your, that's your answer, Simo. <laughs> so no, you, you, it, it, my my life is boxing twenty four seven. So because they have a lot of fighters, and fighters are you know they're boxing different people. Because a lot of people know me as a, as a professional boxing trainer. What are you on there, Jack Dees? Ah, uh, no, nah, mate. You know what? We've got some jack about, right? But I'm saving that nice, for that. weekend. I'm on. Yeah. I'm on my boy Connor. Yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, what were we on about? I forgot. You were just saying about... Uh... <laughs> oh, about being a trainer. Yeah, it's 24-7 because a lot of people know me as a professional boxing trainer. My, my background's Thai boxing. You know, I was a Thai boxer and I've had 48 champions, Thai boxers. I've just crossed over into the boxing world the last couple of years. But I train, I train Thai boxers, I train boxers, I train people who are fighting the cage. I'm a stand-up trainer, so I train, I train all different styles, you know. And um, a lot of boxers come to me because, uh, you know, I can, I can pad southpaws and switch hitters and people who box in both stances, which is, which is pretty hard to do. So I get a lot of switch hitters as well. How did that transition come? I mean, are you still fighting now or are you solely focusing on, you know, no, the, the I, roster that you've got? I think that I'm 30 now. I'm 31 in April. And uh, my last fight when I was 20, I fought from the age of 14 to 20. Um, and obviously my trainer and my partner, who who ended up being partners, he, he passed away. So there was one time in the gym that I was going to Thailand without him. Um, to train at a camp out there and I remember him saying to me you know when you're out there because I was fit and I was going out and I was enjoying it and stuff and I half had it in me I should have a fight out there and stuff like that which I have I have fought out there but he was with me and I just remember him saying you know I don't need to fight without me in your corner so that always stuck by me do you know what I mean and I have I have thought about it many a time I've thought about it many a time loads of times I've, I've thought shall I shall I have one more shall I do you know what I mean and I thought shall I and then I just, um, there's some that's just just holding me back from doing it again. I, I'm enjoying being a trainer. Like I say, I've had some good champions in Thai boxing and, you know, I'm all crossed over to the boxing world now and if everything stays on track, I'll have a lot of champions in boxing too. I can just feel that, man. And and what you've just said with your own experience, have you ever had to face that with uh, somebody who's, you know, been training with you but not only been training with you but a friend has it ever reached a point where you felt it's i think it's time for you to sort of knock this on the edge you know maybe it's their endurance their age whatever but they still got the the fight in them they still feel they want to fight but you think that there's help there or do you know has, have you reached any conversations like that you know what that's a really good question i've never been asked that question before that's a good question i've had i've had lads come to me that don't fight under me 
and ask me, should I take this fight or should I take that fight? And I'll say what way it's at, and I'll have a look at the opponent, and and I'll be I'll be honest with him. I'll say I don't think you're ready, or you know, it's it's you're fighting too heavy, or why would you take that fight? You know, is is the money right? And a lot of fighters generally, you know, don't get paid a lot until the big time. I mean, I fought in Finland against a guy who was 16 and 0 undefeated. I was 16 years old. He was 28. Um, at the time, big stadium, massive, massive, you know, new thing to me. I went over there, I didn't have an air on my chest. I don't even think I had a pube. But um, <laughs> he come in, he had a big, massive beard, everything, big grown block. I thought, what am I doing here? And it was a wonderful fight, it was a hard fight. I got out of the ring, and you know how much I got for that fight? Top of the bill, main event, big stadium, 50 euro. What? I swear to God, I think I spent it on lap dances as well. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've had lads and I say, look, you, there's time, you know, I think you need to call it a day or if you're going to do something, maybe do it for charity, you know, and, and stuff like that. But I haven't really had anyone that's the end of the career and, and I thought you need to knock it on head because like you say in boxing, it's a dangerous sport. And if they start, you know, you can tell by the way they're talking or, you know, the nose is splattered and... The, you know, they can't really get the words out properly. That that's when I'd say look. I know I know how people work and I and I would I would say, look, you're not you're not doing it, you're not fighting under me if I don't I don't think it's right. If someone went to somebody else, would you still as a cause you said there's that relationship as a friend, would you still sort of harbour their best interest and be like, Look, I respect to your own person and I know you've gone somewhere else and they're gonna run it with you, but I still think X, Y, and Z, or would you just wish him well and see how it goes? Um, if if he wanted to fight and they went to a different trainer and they did it that way and and he come down and sat down and talked to me and said he was going to do that, um, then I, then I'd be I'd, I'd be I'd watch I'd go to the fight I'd buy a ticket I'd support him I'd make sure that his best interest is at heart. But if he went behind my back and, and and fucked off somewhere else and went with a different trainer. And, uh, you know, if I spent a lot of years and time with this person, then, you know, I, I hope he didn't get hurt, but I, I won't really want it to go to plan for him, do you know what I mean? I'd, I'd never mm. want anybody to get hurt. But as as a boxing trainer, I spend my life studying and and, and, and looking after that person. They're like, they're like a son or a daughter, do you know what I mean? And you, all your all your time and effort is going into that person that's why you develop a massive and, a, and, a, and such a good bond with people and I think I've learned that because of the bond that I had with, with Steve my trainer when he passed away you know there'd be certain times when he'd pick me up from school and and, and stuff like that to go to the gym I'd go to the gym for three, and, three odd hours on a night and stuff and there's like there were, there were times where I'd go down on a Saturday and he'd be sparring in the ring and I'd get a chair and I'd sit there and I'd just watch him spar and I'd just sit there and watch him spar and just be in awe of what he was doing. And, and I'd ask him questions and probably get on his nerves. But I wanted to be that person. I wanted to be the best the best in that gym. And I wanted to be... And then when I started fighting and I, and I were on a poster, I thought, wow, I'm on a poster. I can't wait to show my mum I'm on a poster, look. Yeah. And then and you see and then your I name went, working up. up then I could the see my name. And, and then next minute, I'm, I'm the main event. And then next yeah. minute, I'm a champion. And then... And then I won a couple of titles and I was fighting international people, fighting in Thailand. And, and um, you know, I, I, fought, I fought some good lads. I fought some lads that are in the UFC. I fought Scott Quigg. I fought, um, I fought Pietro Menga. I fought quite a few world champions, but never got a chance to fight for a world title, which is something that I, um, I uh, you know that that's I've sort of left behind, but hopefully I can I can turn out a few world champions. So I'll be able to cover that. Do you think that because um, when you speak, you can tell the passions there, but you can tell it's 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 not even borderline. It's a pure obsession. Like with, yeah, eat, sleep, yeah. drink. Like so, when people come to you, is that a key fundamental part that they have to have for you to even consider taking one? Because you must reach like a maximum of people where you're like, I'm, I'm like spreading my scent thin here. So then it must be the commitment that, because it must be annoying if they've got the ability, but they're not as devoted as what yeah. you just said there. And and that, that, that does happen. But 
in my gym, there's a lot of boxing gyms where you go in and people look sideways at you and, oh, fucking, you know, he's a boxer and, and all stuff like that. Anybody is welcome in my gym, whether you're world champion or you're coming to take the bin, bins out, everybody will get checked the same. Everybody will get checked the same. Don't matter whether you're five years old or 80 years old, you know, everybody will be get, get checked the same. And as if, I think if you give people a chance in life, and let and you know let them prevail and do what they need to do. I've had kids there, and I thought, wow, he's good. And then and then you don't see him. And I've had kids that, you know, the the, the cunt box eggs, the scandalous, and then they stick at it and stick at it and stick at it. And then two years later, oh, wow, this kid's gonna do something. So I think you need. I think the answer to your question is, I think you need to give people time, people time. And then I've had kids that have looked amazing. That I've looked at, we're getting some funny questions here. I know. People, that, <laughs> people that have looked amazing in the gym, and then it comes to the big time, and their asses fall out because they haven't got none of that. You can be a great, you can be a great fighter, you can be a superstar, but if you've got no under your left tip there, if you've no heart, then then you've you know fighting's not for you because it's roughing. It's a rough, rough, rough old sport. I remember I fought in Thailand. And I fought a Russian and, you know, I think it were about third round in and I thought, what the fuck am I doing here? It was hard as nails. I will not don't get me wrong, I won the fight, but it was hard and hard and hard. And then I just, certain fighters are different. I thought about my mum at home and stuff like that and people who mean stuff to me and who I love. And that's what gets you through fights. And I think you've got to have that in your armour and your artillery to be able to get through what you need to get through. So uh, with, with that, because I think, it's about grit as well. And it seems like it would be an amazing canvas almost for life. That's what I, you know, I, I don't take part in combat sport, but I'm a massive I'm a fan of it. And that's what I get inspired by. I get inspired by what they're willing yeah. to do to almost like prove themselves right, but push themselves farther than they are, further than they've ever been. Yeah, it's great. Do you find, that? Do you, do you find that? I mean, what's the, sorry, what, what's the, what's the like, what is the, Two questions. What's the different motivations that uh, you tend to find people very early on coming to the gym for? And have you ever had anybody who, let's say, their extracurricular life is distracting them and you've had to intervene? Almost like a right. Southpaw moment, you know, the film yeah. or the fighter or something like that. That's another, that's another good question as well. I train a lot of lads that have come from council estates and that don't really have no, or not really have no, pretty much like myself. Um, and a lot of these young lads, and I've got a lot of them in at the moment, that are um, that are trying to better their lives. You know, they're not they've not not much educational wise or stuff like that. And boxing's boxing's a um, it's it's a it's a it's a way out for them. You know, if they're not gifted in school or stuff like that. You know, it, it can be a way out for them because it, it's an incredible sport. Even being in a gym and hitting a bag. And being around boxers, you know, the, these these kids that probably don't have no or out like that can become superstars and champions and earn a lot of money and, and live the life that they need to live, you know. And it takes them off of the streets, and it and it helps the life out and makes it positive. I've had young I've had young guys come in as well who, you know, they're like a spliff and they think they're a bit of a boyo and and all this and a walk through dawn. They might be local hard man you know, local artist in school or something like that, you know, cock it here and all that, thinks he's a bit of a boy or I'll throw him in, he'll jump in ring, I'll throw him in with somebody who's about four years younger, you know, and about a stone and a half lighter and he'll let him whip one into his body and wind him and put him down, do you know what I mean? And then, <laughs> wow, do you know what I mean? It's a total different sport, do you know? That, that's when you see young kids turn into gentlemen, you see a kid yeah. that walk through the door walk through the door, slam it, have a little have a little swagger about him to being the kid that opens the door and lets the next man through. Do you know what I mean? And that's what yeah. boxing does for people. Thai boxing, combat sports does for people's lives. Do you find that um, the sort of outward, uneducated impression is very opposite to what you've just said? And is that almost sometimes a struggle in a sense of like, I suppose the popularity of, of MMA and boxing is that it's not its peak, but with the heavyweight division, there's a lot of interest and there's a lot. Do you know what I mean? But is it yeah. a, a casual fan or somebody who might not think it's 
barbaric. Like, how how do they sort of look at the world of boxing? Do you find you're in like mundane conversations with people where you're like, it's yeah, not it's, just fuggery. It's it's it, you know, it is teaching people respect as well. Of course it is, yeah. It's, it's, it's they call it the school of hard knocks, don't they? I mean, I've had don't get me wrong, I've had some daft questions like, who do you think would win in a fight between Bruce Lee and Spider Man? <laughs> daft stuff like that. But um, from an outside perspective, yeah, it's um, boxing and, and Thai. Unfortunately, Thai boxing's a fantastic sport. It's a, it's a brutal sport. But the guys aren't getting paid enough for what they do. When you're getting punched, kicked, kneed and elbowed, you know, and then they're not getting the money that boxers get or guys in the UFC, which is I don't, why I don't think it's took off as much. So I think Thai boxers need a lot more respect than than they get really. But from how an outside, how does that change? How does that change? How does sponsors and how does how does the popularity of you know these sort of uh, these other sort of peripheral sports, combat sports? How do they get the attention? Um, it, it's a hard one really because boxing so old school goes back to you know the olden days where two men and two men fist fight. You know, and then they put gloves on. Yeah, that's the one. I just think that boxing's just, just, just old school, and it's just had more money put throughout it. And you've got big promoters that have been, that have, that have been involved in big money and stuff like that. Now, don't get me wrong. There's certain shows, you know, Yokow. Um, <laughs> someone's asked me if I should have beef or lamb for the dinner. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's Yokow. There's Yokow, which is a massive sport, and they're doing a great job with. Um, with um, Thai boxing, and I hope that kicks off, and I hope it goes global and stuff like that. But there's, a, there's a massive name called One Championship, which yeah, yeah. is which is paying some big money now, and hopefully that'll take off. I just I just think it's just because boxing's been the old school, the old school put a pair of gloves on and two men fist fight. That is how, that is you know that's the old school sport, and that that's what everybody's bred through, and everybody likes watching it on TV. You know, you get you get big massive shows, and you get all famous actors and people going and stuff like that. It. It's a spectacle. That's what I'm saying, Ben. Yeah. Do you think then, like with bare knuckle, that's proving popular, and that looks like it's going to catch on? Do you think that you could maybe intersect the lineup so you could have on a big boxing promotion? a Thai fight and, you know, a bare knuckle. Do you think something like that could work to shine a light on the others or do you think it's you know very what? channeled and alienated to, to the singular it, sports? Yeah, it is. It is alienated to the singular sport because the British Boxing Board of Control, they, they, um, they just like boxing, 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 boxing. And, you know, and so they should. It's their sport and it's what they love. And, you know, even when I went to, you've got to sit in front of a board of, inspectors when you get your license and they didn't sort of really like that we're from a Thai boxing background and um, you know they, they sort of frowned upon that a little bit and then, until obviously they found out what sort of fighters I was working with and you know working with some good guys at the time Jack Bateson and, and Tyrone Nurse and people like that and obviously Mick Learmonth. I have had shows where I've had boxing on and Thai boxing and, you know, I've had a mixed event like that. We had a great event that I used to put shows on at Royal Armies. I've actually done about 18 shows myself as a promoter. And I did have a mixture did of the fights. audience like, sorry to cut you, did the audience yeah. like the crossover? They loved the crossover, but the feedback I got was they, they preferred the tie boxing. Really? Yeah. Obviously, these are white-collar boxers. They're not as skilled as professional boxers. When you see two professional boxers go... And, and fight each other, it's a work of art, it, you know, it's unbelievable. If you watch some of the greatest fights in history, like Gatti and Ward, you know, and Morales and Barrera, Castillo, Corrales, people like that, you know, th that's when you see the, the spectacle of boxing and, and how good it is. And, and these top level fighters, they deserve every penny they get because of what you've got to put your body through. You've got to train for, say, 10 weeks, run in the morning, train twice a day. And it's not, you know, it's not doing 10 press-ups in garden and having a glass of water. <laughs> it's a... Living the life, wow. you know, Donna, it's the full work. Sorry, P, you cut out a bit then. You cut out just after the uh, glass of water bit. Oh, I'm just saying, yeah, what they do, you know, run in the morning, train twice a day and, and eat the right foods and live the life. And 
a lot of guys take themselves away from their families and uh, you know if they've got kids and stuff like that if they're training for a massive fight they'll go out and train at altitude in places like Tenerife and stuff and they're away from the family and yeah any, anybody can join my club you're more than welcome to join my club Every, anybody's welcome <laughs> so what's the what would you say the difference is between certain areas when you were listing off your sort of uh, the work of art of boxers I felt there were a lot of Mexican names there so yeah. you know what, what would you say you know, you fought a Russian, you fought in Finland. You know, yeah. I say the umbrella is the title of a sport, boxing or mixed martial arts or Thai boxing. That's the umbrella, but there's so yeah. many different variations and styles. How would you yeah. sort of align certain areas of the world to their styles? Do you know what? The, the, the best style that I like in boxing is the Mexican style because they come forward and they wear the heart on the sleeve and they'll stand and they'll trade and they'll fight for 12 rounds, like the life depends on it, you know, and the, if you look at like Mer Barrera Morales, if, if people haven't even seen that fight, it's one of the best fights ever, two men just stand that hated each other, and they just go toe to toe, but then looking at that, if you look at Britain at the moment, we've got a lot of world champions, and we've got a lot of, lot of great fighters coming through that are going to be world champions, you know, and we've got our very own Josh Warrington, who's a world champion, who's undefeated, you know, and I know Josh, Josh is a great lad, you know, and I, there's, a, there's a few guys in Leeds that I, you know, Mick Leomont, who was my fight, I believe that he can be a champion, Jack Bateson, um, God, I hate, I'd hate to miss people out, but you've got Ishmael Khan, Kobe McNamara, who's, who's, who's a great amateur from mine that I think can come to and do some stuff, Callum, I'm not going to keep going through people, because I'll miss <laughs> people out, and then they'll, they'll, they'll text me slagging me off, you know what I mean, but I think, <laughs> I think us as a city as well, because I love my city, I think we're going to produce a lot of champions. But I'd say, you know, you know, Mexico has got the best style. They've, 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 created, they've created some great champions. Julius Cesar Chavez, obviously, have got Canelo. But then you've got to look at Russia, or a tough nation and stuff like that. They've got some great guys. But if I'd have to choose a style, um, I'd, I'd say I like the Mexican style. Do you know what I mean? I like the Mexican style. But then if you go to the amateurs, you've got to look at Cubans. Yes. You no, know, because they've they've ruled the rules for a long a long time with with the amateur amateur style of boxing. But but uh, but Britain as a nation, we're producing some good fighters. What do you um, when you've listed off some of them names there? How do you pace it? How do you know you can? You mentioned it earlier. With, you know you're weighing up who's the best fight. Obviously, you want to get the most exposure and the hardest fight that you believe that can win. But how do you weigh that up? It must be such a minefield. <laughs> Uh, well, you, you, in boxing, in professional boxing, you'll bring your fighter through the through the ranks correctly. So you'll they'll fight what's called journeymen, you know. And, um, German, journeymen will have like a, a mixed record where you know they might have had forty wins, fourteen wins, thirty losses, or something like that. And what they're doing is the 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 learning the sport. They're going through the gears, so they'll start off on four rounds. Then they'll move up to six rounds, then they'll move up to eight rounds, ten rounds, and then championship fights, you know, ten, twelve rounds. They'll go through the gears correctly and they'll will pick the right opponents because what you've got to look at as well is as much as you want the, the best fighters out there, boxing is a business. It's a business. So you've got to bring your fighter through the ranks correctly. You've got to make sure that he's he's healthy and he's fit and he's he's taking the right fights at the right time. And in doing that, you need a good manager. And Mark Bateson manages my fighters and I've got to say he's a fantastic manager and promoter and he, he looks after our guys and um, for example Mickles 10 and 0 now he's just had a six rounder he'll probably move up to another six rounder then an eight rounder and then hopefully next year um, we'll be um, <laughs> someone's just put some <laughs> hopefully we'll be fighting for um, you know titles and stuff like that but can I just say this uh, someone's put the best fight I've ever seen is when Laurie and Adam in Maywood Club. <laughs> Laurie's the lot. That's our lassie's sister. He says the best fight is when she chinned her boyfriend in Maywood Club. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the comments have been off limits, man. Proper it's been quality. She's on now, look, <laughs> she's, she's, up there. she's got a left up like Jeremy Beadle. <laughs> <laughs> Mad man. <laughs> you like that one, didn't you? <laughs> you know what you were just saying there with the manager and the trainer side? How yeah. do you um 
do you ever get pressures from promoters? And especially, like you say, you had a fighter on the UFC card. There's moments where you might be trying to get their attention, but then they might yeah. present someone that you think is completely like, whoa, but you, it's that door in. Like, how, how's the, what's the stepping stones? <laughs> You, it's the it's a big fight. You need a big fight. Once you get that big fight, and you get a, you get a big promoter after you. For example, Frank Warren or someone like Eddie Hearn. Then you're looking at the big time. Do you know what I mean? Then then you're looking at fighting at big arenas and first direct arena. And I've been very privileged to to walk out at first direct arena with Jack Bates and I'm with Tyrone Nurse for Jack Catchell and I've been to Australia and I've, as the main event over there. And once you get the foot in the door with a couple of big big promoters. I'm thinking, oh, this kid's got some good fighters or he's got some good lads here. I want them on my show. And I like to have exciting fighters. I like to have fighters that are skillful and they've got a bit of flair and, you know, they've, they've got a, a, a confidence about them without being arrogant and cocky. And like I say, it's a business. You need to have... If, if you're a fantastic fighter... But, you know, you're like this and you won't talk to no one or you, you don't really want to know anyone. You've got to put yourself out there a little bit. You've got to put yourself out there, Ricky. You've got to put yourself out there and you've got to be... Um, if you want to earn the money that you want to earn and live the life that you want to live, you've got to make sure that you put yourself out there and you get involved, whether it whether it is... I, I hate to say this, whether it is calling someone out or bad, you know, bad mouthing them or maybe slagging them off a little bit to get that fight. Once you get that fight, you can go up my after and say, you know what, I just built this up for the fight. I need that fight. I've got mortgage, I've got rent to pay or whatever I need. You know, you've got to put food on your table and for fighters, they've got to make themselves a profile. Would you say that's quite a, a modern thing, uh, quite a recent thing that's been added to you know, there's a lot of people who don't really like getting involved with that trash talk side of things, but it does seem a very, you know, yeah. social media clickbait sort of world now. It does seem that that's what gets a lot of attention. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I mean, I'm I'm not really massively down for like for 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 people falling out and and, and calling each other out and stuff like that. I prefer it to be, you know, to to go shake hands, say, right, okay, we're going to fight, we'll fight and shake hands after. I prefer it to be like that. But, you know, if someone puts it on your toes and they want it, you've got to give them a few licks, haven't you? Yeah, man. I've seen, actually, you put a post up where um, one of the other fight that we're going to be on Sky Sports and so you, one of your fighters, the dude were yeah. giving him a bit of jip or something and then you ended up going and, and cleaning out some of them. <laughs> I don't know. We've had a few moments like that. We've had, we've had wanes where people have tried to carry on with each other and stick nutting and stuff like that. We've had to pull them apart. But as a trainer, I just try to um, just try to look after my fighter, really, and make sure that he don't get involved in any conflict or like that. And, you know, not putting... Don't get me wrong, you can you can put on how you're training or what you're doing or what you think you might do with him. You might pick around, you might beat him in or something like that. But I, I, it's not really for me. I've never been like that. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of chilled out and... I like to get on with everybody, really. There, man. What about Drew, them? Drew there. You see Drew here? Drew Golden Team. Drew. Yeah, He's yeah. got the biggest feet I've ever seen in my life. They're about a size 20. <laughs> <laughs> man, Ed, man. Uh, oh, so, all right, before I get into the next question, someone asked earlier, who's loudest in gym? Who's the loudest in the gym? That's Stefan, that's <laughs> put that. Basically, it takes piss out of me, other trainer does, does turn amateurs. I think we've lost him again. Sorry, P, you, sorry, you cut out just as you were saying, uh, does train I'm amateurs. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. So you were saying, yeah, does train amateurs. amateurs. Yeah, and basically, someone always messages me saying, how come? Because when he holds the pads, when, say for example, one minute, let me get this straight. So when he holds the pads, yeah. Yeah. The fighter, you... How do I stop the meme? The fighter... You... Oh, sorry, you cut out again, bro. Usually. So just with the pads. So, usually, if you're a boxer and you hit the pads, you breathe out, ish, ish, ish. Do you know what I mean? For Obviously, yeah. you get more power, but if you were to get hit to the body and you breathe out, ish, you won't get winded. But for some reason, when Daz holds the pads and they're hitting him, he goes, ish, 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 <laughs> ish, and he screams at him. <laughs> So he messages me, but I think that just makes him feel better. Do you ever, do you ever see um, like uh, baseline raves or like niche raves or old school stinking? Yeah, I love people that. dancing I love like the would people dancing like the boxing. Yeah. Oh, do do people ever just go to the gym just to get some dance moves off you? 
Like so a, like a four-beat combination? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've had private lessons where I've sort of shown them a combination, say, jab, jab, cross. And I've seen them doing it in space. Scars. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, fucking, a lot of them just like to come to learn a couple of combinations and, and, and say that they know how to dance. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good man. You're a good man. I've taken up a lot of your time. I've just got a couple more if you're cool. Just, uh, That's all right, mate. Take your time. Take your time. Proctor's joined in now, so he'll have some grief to give me. <laughs> I'd just like to um, sort of take it back then to, you know, the origins of the gym. And also, a lot of what you're speaking about, it's incredible because you're just sort of reeling off what is your experience, but it's not like yeah. there's a rule book in what you've learned. So yeah. are there any standout moments where, for example, the, the uh, cutting weight, you started to outline what works and what didn't. And you know, like where, where you've said you've been out for 18 years, like, and you've yeah. got a well of experience there and you're able to just like regale it off like the back of your hand because you live and believe yeah. it. But, as I say, these are lessons that you've had to learn along the way. So can you just sort yeah. of take us on a journey through the life of gold? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what all started. I'll tell you what all started. I, um, as a trainer, I, were, I was sort of fighting and, and doing really well. And I, I was two times British champion at the time. Uh, oh, no, sorry. I'd won a first title. I was 15 or something like that. 15. And then somebody was in the class. And Steve, who was my trainer, who we became partners, somebody come up to me. This is the best interview I've ever seen. This somebody, <laughs> somebody come up to me and says, um, can I have a private lesson? And I went, you what? And he says, can I, can I have a private lesson? So I ran over to Steve. I said, this guy wants me to take him for a private lesson. I thought, the fuck he wants a private lesson with me? I'm only 15. <laughs> so he went, yeah. So how it all started was, well, I started training this one guy. I used to run to the gym on a Sunday. We only had a small gym. It was like a little shed, like a garage. Uh, I'd run down to the gym. I'd train this guy for one hour. Um, and then I'd sweep the gym, take the bins out, and I'd run home. And that was my deal because this guy would pay me that I would do for Steve. So I'd clean the gym. And then I started having privates. And then somebody else had asked me for one. And then somebody else and somebody else. And ended up having more privates than Steve. <laughs> and he was gutted, do you know what I mean? And then I started teaching classes with him. And we used to teach all over at, the, at that moment in time. We didn't just teach at this little gym. It wasn't really big enough. So on a Wednesday, we went to a place called The Link, which is the bank machine. And we teach them over on a Wednesday. Then we teach at Leeds Grammar School. Then we go to Wookton and teach there. Um, and, and I'd go everywhere with him, do you know what I mean? And I idolised him, you know, and I'd just listen to his stories and, and how he'd speak about me. And when I had fights coming up and I was nervous, the way he would talk about me, I'd, I'd, I'd believe that I could be anybody like I was untouchable, do you know what I mean? Obviously, I'd still get nervous and I'd, and I, and I'd find it hard, but I'd believe that nobody could beat me. And then, as, and, then I, and I got to about 16. The first fight he ever had was a guy called Michael Atchinson. And he was 4-0. Oh, he had four fights for me, four wins. And then he moved to Australia. And then I started training all sorts of, all sorts of different fighters. And, and I was still fighting myself at the time. Now, a regret that I have is... Am I back? Oh, mate. I tell you what, that was proper, like... Uh, that was proper EastEnders, like, cliffhanger moment. You went... The regret I had, and then it just cut out. <laughs> <laughs> Part so two sorry, mate, coming Wednesday. The, 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 regret, so, the yeah, regret you've had. At the, at, the t at the time, I was, I was, I was training fighters and fighting, and I, and I paid the ultimate price for it because I, I was only eighteen at the time, and I fought a guy come, called from France who was a European champion, and I was spending a lot of time with my fighters, and I wasn't spending. I can fair, I can honestly say that I, you know I've had a lot of fights and I've been in with some good guys. Um, I got ripped off in the world championships in Thailand. I should have won the gold medal there, I believe. But one one fight that I can safely say that I lost fair and square was against a guy called Sidi Diallo from France. And um, you know he, 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 I was in the ring and I wasn't right. I was missing and and you know and, and he beat me. He beat me fair and square. And then sort of after that fight, I had I had. I had another fight for a guy who was actually a French champion, but the weight above, and I knocked him out. And, and uh, I, I stopped taking privates, and I trained properly for that. And that I learned my lesson by 
tra tra train myself and train fighters. That's why I won't fight again, because my heart lies in fighters. I've had loads of experiences with fighters where, you know, even young kids, young kids, I've had, I've had junior, I've had a junior world champion, a uh, junior gold medalist in Baltic championships. And he, he, you know, I've learned that different, different people, you know, work differently and, you learn the experience of stuff about food, about nutrition as you go along. So I, in the boxing world, I'm a young trainer, but realistically, I've been training people since I was 14. So I've got, I've got a lot of experience and that's what I can sort of see it as well. A lot of time, you know, when I go to boxing shows and I'm in the gym, you know, for a lot of them are 50, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all boys. And I think, I think well, until I start working my magic a bit with the pads, then they sort of know why well, he knows what he's on about. Do you know what I mean? But... Um, yeah, I think if you if anybody that's wanting to be a trainer or learning, the best thing you can do is study and go down and watch. The, you know, go down to the gym and watch people how people work. I still do it now. I will watch Freddie Roach. I watch Canelo's trainer. I watch what Joe Gallagher does, and I'll take different stuff from different trainers, and I'll and I'll bring it into what I do. Do you know what I mean? And is there I think. Any Sorry to cut you. Is there any other sports or any other uh, popular culture or anything that you sort of lean in that helps with your training? Any other inspirations outside of the boxing world? Outside of the boxing? Any sports? Any sports or any life? You know, is there any, like you were just saying there, you, you, you sort of pick up styles, but you do it in your own way from people that are in your profession. But I wonder if there's, yeah, of a sport in art athletes or i don't know if there's any other yeah. people in public figures uh who yeah who, who you lean on and if you could share them you've got you've got to admire in, in you know in, in in you've got to admire any any athlete that does any sport do you know what i mean and you know obviously you, you know stuff like you know, like rugby, I have a guy, Jamie Peacock, who's, who's, a, who's a rugby legend. I think he got Man of Steel twice, he trains with me. You know, and I, I've got a lot of respect for him and people like that. And I watch I watch how how he, how he works in the gym and how he trains and how to tell him to do something. And he won't fucking stop until he's finished that. And I, I think that boils down to mentality. And I think he's probably one of the mentally, most mentally strong people that I've met. And, you know... A lot of the time, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here at the top of the pyramid because these fighters look up to me or they come to me for answers or questions or stuff like that. So for me as a person, I've got a lot on my shoulders. And for someone to be in the gym like that, for example, like Jamie Peacock, it's nice for me to sit down and ask Jamie, what does he do? Or how does he work? Or his experiences? Or what that right upper cut were like that he ate that kid from New Zealand, were we? <laughs> <laughs> I can't even make kids now. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stuff, stuff. You know, you've got to admire people like that. And I did, I did admire um, um, the 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 Tour de France cyclist. Is it Neil? Oh, Lance. Lance. I yeah, did. Before it came I, out. I, I, I admired what he what he did, and I remember watching some of it. Can you see me? Sorry, bro. Yeah, you cut out just yeah. as you were saying. Um, Willie, Willie Mason, Armstrong. that's it. Yeah, he had, he had cancer and then he went out for a run and this old person took over him, you know, and, and, and beat him on this run. And he was like a Tour de France, you know, cyclist. And then he came back from having cancer to win the Tour de France again. But it, it came out that he was, yeah. he 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 you know, doping and stuff like that. And, um, you know, but like boxing wise, you know, you've got to admire all the greats like Muhammad Ali and you know, I love Mike Tyson, stuff like that. And what about how Mike Tyson's reinvented himself? It's sick, isn't it? He's found himself, hasn't he? He has, man. You, fa you find a lot of that though with people with, with, with big superstar names like that. You find you find a you find a lot of that. You know, they either find a religion or or they go find themselves. You know, you know whether it's whatever they're doing, but they sort of reform the character, don't they? You know, I think, pe I think people like that have, a, have a, um, you know, because they live such a fast life, I think it gets to a point where they think, you know, I've got to fucking sort myself out here. Yeah, when they're in the spiral of, like, the hedonism that must be fame at that level, 
Where yeah. everyone's saying yes and you're getting everything thrown at you. It must seem like a bit out of your control, like how, how you face yeah. it. So, that, especially that, someone like Mike Tyson at the, the era that he was in, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think what you've got to do, I think with, with people like that, you've got to admire the people that actually, actually, you know, for example, like um, when they when they hit fame, and stuff like that, and then and then they get involved in in whatever they get involved in, and partying and stuff like that, you know. And they're over the newspapers, and and, and they're not they're not living the life of the athlete. Um, but but then you see people like you know, like say for example, David Beckham, who's like a great role model. You, you always see you know, even like Ronaldo, and you see what he does for charity and and stuff like that. I think that them who can stay like that. And, and, and keep it like that. I think they're the ones that should be the greats. And, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've done it myself and I've fallen off, off the wagon and stuff like that. And, and I'll be the first to admit, but the people that can stay cool and, and do their sport uh, to the best of their ability and then be a role model for the rest of their lives, I think they, they should really be the greats. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because it's the discipline, like you say, it's a sacrifice, but it's the discipline, man. Like it's the dis it's the discipline. People, which people can't really like unless you're in that position, like the discipline I have discipline trying to get out of bed. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and they've got a discipline like on a whole other level. That's it, isn't it? That's it, that's it, that's it. I mean it's it's come on. Oh no, sorry, sorry, go on. I've just uh I'm going to wrap up with just one more question, if that's all right. Yeah, not a next problem. Guest on at five. No so, are you aware about Jamie Peacock and they were talk about him fighting Rio in a, some form of like amateur uh, yeah, charity boxing? That, Do you think that was it happened? That was actually in my gym. So, me and Jamie had finished the session and um, obviously he's well, he's well known. Do you know what I mean? He says, right, he says, I want to have a fight. I says, yeah, no problem. So, we were trying to sort stuff out for Jamie to get him a boxing match. No matter where he'd box, he'd fill it out, you know what I mean? Because he's such yeah. a big name. And then um, he says, um, he sort of put it on Rio's toes because Rio were getting a boxing licence and he put it on his toes, he put it on Twitter and stuff like that and then he just never had no back. And then it, it, it turned out, unfortunately, that, um, you know, that he got knocked back for a boxing licence, did Rio Ferdinand? Because what happens is they send somebody out to study the person to see if they're good enough to to be in that to be in a boxing ring. Do you know what I mean? But um, I'm touching on that as well. Rio Ferdinand. I watched a I watched a really good documentary about it the other day, and he, he lost his he lost his partner, and then he, um, he 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 met somebody else, and that somebody else took took his took his kids on and stuff like that. I think it, what were it on ITV. Or Becoming a step family, and that's a good watch if anybody wants to see out like that. It's, it's it's something that means something to me as well. So it's yeah, it's it was nice to watch. So I've got a lot, even though obviously we called him out and stuff like that. He's got a lot of respect for him for what he's been through and stuff. Respect, man. I tell you what, I'm going to end it with this one, brother. Is that yeah. um, if James up for a fight, you know, yeah. I, I know people and that, yeah, and I can yeah. reach out to Idris yeah. Elba, right? How about this, right? Yeah, we've. Obviously, the uh, unfortunate situation with Rob Burrows. If we could do something for charity, and if yeah. we were able to put something like that, do you think yeah. it'd be something that could be talked about? It, it just celebrates Thai boxed as well. He's, he's done a bit of Thai boxing, and yeah. he's not bad. So, yeah. if you can get that sorted, I know Jamie would take it straight away. Right. Let me see what I can do. Sort what of, we can uh, do, and let's let's raise some money for a great for a great guy and a exactly. legend, a legend of our city. Exactly. Couldn't, uh, you know what, mate? Couldn't have ended it any better than that. You're a fucking yeah. gent, you are, mate. You are. You so Thank man. you for your time. All the best, speaking. mate. speaking. And uh, when this is all done, we should catch up for a bit anyway, man. It'd be nice 100%, to get on a proper level. percent mate. Thank you for having me on. Good, man. Respect, Take it easy. Good luck with Jim and everything as well, yeah? Take Stay care. safe through this time, Th brother. Peace. Thank you. You too. Respect. Respect. Bye-bye. So yeah, that is the second guest of Loose Lips. That was P from Golden Team Gym and uh, incredible chat. I, I reason I wanted to reach out to him is because every time he, he speaks, he's just so profound and it's always genuine. You know, I think as a Yorkshireman, you say stuff and you want to back it and you want to back it to call it and like, but you want to say it with a sense of like graciousness and 
I don't know, he just has those characteristics. He's a good guy, so hopefully you enjoyed the chat that came across and uh, good luck to anybody who's training at his gym, who's involved with him as well, who's been watching. Thank you, everybody, for checking in. Uh, I'm going to have another chat. I'm going to go for a quick slash, <laughs> and then I'm going to have another chat at five with a uh, musician, Adam French, who is signed to Virgin EMI and he's doing big bits. Uh, Kyle Minogue's a big fan and he's a sick musician and a good lad. So I'll log off this. I'll see you all. Stay safe, stay cool. And if you want to join me again in a few moments, you know where I'm at. Peace.